units. Okay, each group leads chooses one case. The, the case with the most energy and the wealth of the information. I know this can go on forever, but uh, can we take one table first, maybe this table first? Yeah, you are supposed to choose one and explain it to the other one. Okay, one more minute to choose one case per table, Uh, we are working closely with, with the protected area management.
Management Board, and the whole process is supported by a GAFU and DP grant. Uh, it's called the New Cap New Conservation Areas Program in the Philippines. Uh, we are now into the third phase where there will be seven claims inside the national park. We are in, we have fully documented two claims, along with a whole traditional conservation management plan of the community. What the park management will follow now is a community conservation plan based on traditional governance. <coughs> but of course, technical expertise and support is very well accepted and we'll be working side by side with the community. Thank you so much. This is a, can you pass the microphone to another table, please? Uh, a few more key words. Uh, technical expertise, funds, we have the, the needs for funds coming in, uh, and again, traditional governance uh, systems and rules, and modern governance systems and rules, the interface which can be a dialogue rather than a clash. Okay, thank you. Uh, the case that I'm going to share is from uh, Southern Africa. I think Southern Africa has got one of the largest concentration of transfrontier conservation areas to led to the management of shared resources. So we have got a number of them, including the, the, the Great Lumpopo Transfrontier Park, involving South Africa, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. We also have got the Kazan, involving Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, and uh, Zimbabwe as well. But the one that I'm going to share involves Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Zambia, called the Zimoza Transfrontier Conservation Area. So what we tend to hear is that the borders are divided using uh, mountains and also rivers, as if wildlife and all these other natural resources recognize these political boundaries. So what we tend to hear is that one of the rivers, the Zambez River, is shared between Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Mozambique. So the challenge is the fishery resources, whereby we seem to have thriving fishing communities on the Zambian side and also on the Mozambican side, because their laws are very enabling. But on the Zimbabwe side, the laws are very strict. So that has resulted in conflict between these communities, whereby communities on the Zimbabwe side don't see any incentive for conserving these fishery resources because they simply say, if we conserve them, they'll be caught on the Zambian and Mozambican side. So what benefit is there for us? So are we just keeping these fishery resources for the benefit of these communities in Mozambique and, uh, and Zambia? Well, it, uh, for us, it's, it's a problem. So this has actually resulted in conflict. On the Zimbabwe side, you cannot fish as an individual, you have to form a cooperative, but on the Zambian side, you can fish as an individual, and the same applies on the Zambian side as well. Again, for you to apply for a permit, you have got to travel about 300 kilometers to the capital city in Harare, but on the Zambian side, they can apply under the, from the rural district councils, which are just about uh, five kilometers or so. So that actually enables them to, 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 to do the fishing without any, any, any problems. And again, the, the, the fishing periods are also different. So you can have close periods in on, the Zamb on the Zimbabwean side, but on the Zambian and Mozambique side, they are fishing. And again, you can also have fishing periods on the Zimbabwean side, or the, 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 the Zambian and Mozambique side. So this is actually result in a lot of conflict. Fantastic, rich example. So we have the borders. The borders, another fundamental element of the spatial analysis that uh, is uh, implied in governance. You have also the interface between the biophysical environment and the political environment, which is fundamental in this case. So, and, and so much more, I mean, the per permits, periods, the, the fact that there are some superstructures that are imposed on the ecology that are actually the visible face of governance. Uh, the next table, would you like to go, please? Uh, with the examples I'm going to give, and Kevin, do come and help me if I get stuck, because Kevin knows this example very well as well. Um, at the moment in New Zealand, um, so this is work in progress. The Conservation Authority um, has a role to play in terms of declaration of new national parks. There's a very clear process um, that new national park uh, declarations go through. This process has been underway for 12 years. The authority is currently considering 
a very much scaled down proposal for a, by New Zealand standards, a relatively small national park that's in an area of the country where there has been, um, in New Zealand we have a process of settling um, grievances that relate back to the colonial period, and this area has been um, settled through that tribunal process. The area uh, proposed for a national park has a special classification under that process, which outlines the relationship between the government agency, if you like, and the local indigenous people. The, uh, the government of the day is politically very committed to declaration of this park. The local people are keen to have a national park. Um, the local people, in terms of wanting to have a national park, uh, say that they wish for that to be co-governed and there's no current definition or understanding of what that co-governance means or whether there's co-management. We have a system of local boards which involve local um, communities and they are an integral part of the consultation process to develop a new national park. Uh, the statute currently doesn't enable that form of a form of particular code governance to be in place in the way we think that the local people want. That dialogue process is currently underway. Um, so we have overlays of um, agreements between the local people and the government. We have existing management structures in place. Um, we have a political commitment in place. And um, at the moment, we're actually working, working our way through uh, what that means for the local people. But the current legislative framework doesn't enable that to happen easily. We're not sure where it will, where it will land precisely. The local people have also said that in the um, declaration of the park, they want to um, ensure that their cultural and sacred sites um, are well protected, which is possible. But of course, uh, they are also saying they want visit more visitors, more economic opportunity. But they are afraid that you know there will be too many people who come. So um, there's that, that there are those issues. So it's very much. Um, a work in progress, but I guess there is a patchwork of, um, or a mosaic of agreements that relate to this land, and some of them are in place to enable certain things, and others, I guess, are not quite enabling enough to accommodate what is required right now. And how this plays out, I'm unclear, but Kevin, you may have a comment you would like to make about this example. I think, yeah, I, I actually think that uh, we have gone over time already. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to stress a couple of uh, points in, uh, in this example, which are again bringing back some of the points made before. The one of history and the indigenous peoples is one of the terms that we heard very much. What, what is indigenous if not? something that really relates to history and the place and is quite fundamental. Then even the different understanding of the same concepts or lack of clear understanding of concepts that are supposed to shape authority, responsibility, behaviors and rules. That's a fundamental element in, in governance conflicts that we find in many places in the world. And, and another extremely <coughs> element that I find in your presentation is the one of the limits. Where are the limits of so-called economic development that we are going together to decide for a particular place and situation? This is one of the fundamental rules of appropriate governance, to define certain types of limits for behaviors as well as for overall uh, so-called development and conservation. We still have one table to go and we are already over time. That's why I cut you short, I'm really sorry. But uh, yeah, we will not get coffee if we are late. So that's the big responsibility of this table to be short, sweet, and very meaningful. Also, uh, I, I seem to have uh, one minute. <laughs> yeah, my case.